Hello, welcome to Guide London. My name is Nick Salmond. I'm a London Blue Badge Tourist Guide and a member of Guide London, which is the site that represents the members of the Association of Professional Tourist Guides. We have around 600 members and one thing they have in common is they've all qualified for a London Blue Badge Tourist Award. That means that you're qualified to guide in London. Now, usually we spend the year showing people around this wonderful city. But of course, this year we've had COVID to cope with and the Lo London has been in lockdown uh, really for most of the year. So instead of taking people around in person, we've been offering some virtual tours and we've been doing some broadcasts here on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter to bring a little bit of London to you wherever you are in the world. Um, if you've missed any of our broadcasts and we've done well over 40 now, then you can find them all on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, search for, for Guide London and you can find all our broadcasts there. They cover history and they cover kings and queens. They cover some of the great buildings of London, places like Westminster Abbey, uh, St Paul's Cathedral, the Tower of London. And we also talk about some of the people who've lived in the city over the years. Uh, we're broadcasting at the moment every Tuesday at this time. So that's four in the afternoon if you're watching from the UK or 11 in the morning if you're watching on the east coast of America. So do try and join us every week at this time. Now this week we're talking about a very important event in American history, an event that celebrates its 400th anniversary this year. And that is the sailing of the ship, the Mayflower, from England over to the coast of New England, taking the Pilgrim Fathers to found the first um, permanent European settlement in the New England area. Now it is the 400th anniversary this year, so there was a lot of events planned to help mark that anniversary. Um, a lot of them uh, were hit by the COVID crisis and so didn't take place. Some have taken place virtually and some have taken place without an audience. But hopefully um, when the pandemic is over, you'll come to London and you can see some of the places um, associated with the Mayflower and celebrate the 400 years, um, albeit slightly late. So I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by London Blue Badge Guide, Emily Lawrence Baker. Now, Emily is not only a qualified Blue Badge Tourist Guide for London, but she is a descendant from one of the people who traveled on the Mayflower that 400 years ago. So Emily's going to tell us all about the trip over there, about some of the um, places in London you can visit if you're interested in the Mayflower story. Um, we are open for questions, so if you've got any questions for Emily about the whole Mayflower story, about the Pilgrim Fathers, um, about the settlements in North America, then just put them in the comments and we'll try and answer as many questions as we can at the end of the broadcast. But without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Emily, who's going to tell us the story of the Mayflower. Emily. Thank you very much, Nick. Yes, indeed, it is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower sailing from Plymouth, England to what is today Plymouth, Massachusetts. So this was a very brave group. I would venture to say that you could almost call them radical um, because they were a group of Protestants seeking to separate. They were known as separatists. They were looking to separate from the Church of England because they couldn't worship in the way that they wanted here in England. So they must have really, really wanted to leave because they were willing to get on board uh, a rather unreliable ship and sail across the Atlantic into a completely unknown world. It was unknown to them anyway. Um, so a really brave undertaking. Now, um, a couple of things before I launch into my talk about this uh, to consider. Um, they, they take a huge place. The Mayflower Pilgrims hold a huge place uh, in American history, particularly in the New England area where I'm from. I am from very near Plymouth, Massachusetts, and they have an almost mythical status there, the Mayflower Pilgrims. Um, and I would venture to say that it is um, one story about the founding of America, but it is not the story. And there are so many elements to consider when you're looking at the story of the Mayflower Pilgrims. Now, it's a story that's traditionally told from the perspective of the Pilgrims, particularly in the Northeast where I grew up. 
but they were a small group of settlers and uh, they certainly weren't the first on the land. They certainly weren't the first from Europe. So why do they hold this huge uh, place? It's almost a disproportionate legacy relative to the size of the group. So that's just something to think about. And one of the things that the 400th anniversary celebrations, um, they have been going on um, just in a more muted context. But one of the things that they are emphasizing, I'm glad to say, is the story of the Native Americans who figure very prominently in this story. Um, as I said, it's traditionally been told from the perspective of the pilgrims, but it needs to be told from the perspective of Native Americans as well, because they were very much on the land when the Mayflower pilgrims arrived. Um, so this land appeared to be empty to the Mayflower pilgrims when they uh, landed in November of 1620. And um, if you look at this next slide, uh, this is from the 1900s, so it's obviously more built up than when the Mayflower arrived, but it gives you an idea of what the coastline looked like. Um, in the 16th century, New England was home to more than 100,000 Native Americans. So it was a very full and very prosperous and sophisticated society. And this is an element of the story that tends to get overlooked in, in this tale of the Mayflower Pilgrims. And I just wanted to raise that at the beginning because we are gonna talk mostly about the Mayflower Pilgrims, but it's important to keep that in perspective. Now they called this land Patuxet. So when the Mayflower Pilgrims arrived, it already had a name, it already was um, um, fully settled. However, when the Mayflower Pilgrims came, there, was not, there were not too many people there. And that's because um, most of the population had been wiped out by plague uh, in the three years preceding the Mayflower's arrival. So this was some disease, possibly smallpox, that had been brought from uh, Europe and infected the Native Americans and most had died out. So that is one reason why the land would have looked empty to the Mayflower Pilgrims. Um, the Native Americans also farmed differently than the English, so they would have left the land filled with trees, un unlike the English who would have cleared the land. So for all intents and purposes, it looked um, vacant to them. And I just wanted everyone to keep that in mind. For the purposes of this talk right now today, I thought we'd begin with a look at some London landmarks relative to the Mayflower Pilgrim story, because you might not realize it, but actually um, London has, has quite a few uh, landmarks. So this is a map on your screen uh, of the L London. You can see the River Thames at the center. And that circular area there is where Rotherhithe is. Now Rotherhithe um, is a neighborhood in East London. It's about two and a half miles east of Tower Bridge, which you may be familiar with. And it is a traditional shipping port. So in the 16 and 1700s, lots of ships were built here. It would have been a very, very busy part of town. And there were indeed docks here up until the 1970s. So it, it definitely has a, a history of shipping. Now, eventually shipping moved further east, partly because ships got larger um, and the river couldn't take that amount of traffic. Uh, the area of Rotherhithe was bombed during World War II and um, it all fell into disrepair. So in the 1980s, it began to be redeveloped. And uh, in 1999, the Jubilee line was put in there. So it changed. And this is what you see today. So this is right. This is a photo taken right along the riverside, uh, the Thames River in Rotherhithe. And you can actually walk all the way from Tower Bridge to Rotherhithe, most of the way right on the river. You have to go inland a little bit, but most of the way you can go along um, and, and keep the river in view. So you're looking east now toward the uh, Canary Wharf. That's what those tall buildings are. This is um, one of the financial centers in addition to the city of London here in London. Um, and then this next slide shows the view that you get looking back toward the city of London. And this is, it's worth going to Rotherhithe just to get this photo. It's absolutely beautiful. And you can see all the new buildings, um, which the Mayflower Pilgrims certainly would, would not recognize. Um, it's grown up so much. Now, why Rotherhithe relative particularly to the Mayflower? Well, the captain of the Mayflower, Christopher Jones, lived in Rotherhithe, and he'd been there for um, quite a few years by the time the Mayflower sailed. He owned a quarter portion of the Mayflower ship, 
and he used it to ferry goods between England and Europe, so mostly France, Portugal, Spain, um, and an occasional trip to the Canary Islands. So the furthest he'd sailed was the Canary Islands. Um, that's relevant because he was about to embark on a transatlantic voyage. Now, this is a memorial to Christopher Jones in the church, St. Mary Rotherhithe, um, and he's shown looking back toward England and holding a little boy who's looking forward to the new world. And on the base of the statue is written the term planters and adventurers. And this is indeed how the pilgrims thought of themselves. They didn't call themselves pilgrims. Um, they thought of themselves as planters. This was the group of religious separatists who were going to, in essence, plant a new civilization. Now, that term pilgrim does indeed come from William Bradford. He was the second governor of the colony, and he did indeed describe their group as saints who left Holland as pilgrims. And that's where it comes from. But it didn't become popular until the 1800s to call this group on board the boat um, the pilgrims. Now, Christopher Jones, he had originally intended, he was hired to simply sail the Mayflower over, leave the group there and sail back. And this was because there was going to be a second ship accompanying them, uh, the Speedwell. Um, well, unfortunately, the Speedwell um, had many leaks, a lot of problems, and it ended up staying in England. And uh, this is one of the reasons that Christopher Jones ended up staying longer in America than he had originally intended. The Mayflower did return to London in the spring of uh, 1621. And then uh, Christopher Jones died not, not long after that. So he is buried uh, within the churchyard of St. Mary Rotherhithe. We don't know where because there have been so many changes to this land um, since his burial. Um, bombings in World War II and the church was rebuilt and somewhere along the line we lost track of his grave. But he is there somewhere and that's why the memorial is there. There's another memorial uh, at St. Mary Rotherhithe. There's a blue plaque to the Mayflower Pilgrims. Now, um, Christopher Jones, he probably didn't realize what he was getting into. Uh, it, it, not having transatlantic experience was huge. And the, remember that the Mayflower was a cargo ship. Uh, so this, this, he was taking on quite a task, but he was smart enough to uh, hire crew who were more experienced than he was. And it's alleged that he hired that crew at a local pub. Um, so this is the Angel Pub in Rotherhithe. It's right along the river. Uh, it's a beautiful place to go, actually. Now, it is true that Christopher Jones hired his crew at the Angel, but not this building. This is a newer building, and the original Angel Pub that was indeed there in the 1600s uh, was in a slightly different location. But I think it's okay if you go and have a drink and say that you were in the same pub where Christopher Jones hired his crew. Uh, there's another pub that features uh, even more prominently in the Mayflower story, and that is aptly called the Mayflower. And this one's located just a tiny bit east of the Angel Pub. Beautiful place to go. They have an outdoor ter terrace in summer, and um, it's on the back side of this photo. So this backs up onto the river. You can see where the Mayflower ship was anchored before it set sail. So Christopher Jones, it's alleged that he had it anchored there to save on taxes further down river. I don't know if that's true, but I do know that the uh, some of the passengers boarded here in London, about 65 people boarded the Mayflower here, and they sailed on to Southampton, which was the first port of call. And the reason they went to Southampton is because they were meeting up with that ship I mentioned before, the Speedwell. The Speedwell was hugely important because it was carrying English passengers from the north who had fled England years before in pursuit of religious freedom. So they went to Holland first and then they decided Holland wasn't working out for them either. So they sailed to Southampton on the Speedwell and then some of them got on board uh, the Mayflower and they all went on to uh, the new world. Now the Mayflower does celebrate its associations with America. I believe it's the only pub in England to sell US stamps. And it also has an opportunity for Mayflower descendants to sign their, um, they have a book of Mayflower descendants. And if you can prove your lineage, you can sign this book. 
So I've lived in London for 30 years and I'd never done this. I, I think I was a bit shy about, about my background. It, it has, it can have connotations in America. So I kept quiet about it, but I went along last year and signed. It was great fun. Um, I'm a descendant of four people on the Mayflower and I, and I really got pleasure in signing this book. So I would urge people to do that. What's interesting about the descendants is that there are probably um, uh, about 35 million people worldwide who are descended from passengers on the Mayflower. But what's really interesting is that it was only about 37 passengers who have descendants. And this is because so many people died in the first year. It was a horrific journey and a horrific first year and a lot of them died. Um, so, it, quite a legacy. Again, that goes back to that legacy with a relatively um, small group of people. Now, um, why was it so difficult? Well, one reason was that that ship, the Mayflower ship, was indeed a cargo ship. Now, this is kind of a funny illustration, but I'm using it because it shows you that there were no windows. So it was built, the Mayflower was built as a cargo ship. It, it never intended to have people on it. So it's below decks was very low and cramped. And the passengers uh, basically shared space. They lived in the cannon deck with four cannons. Um, and they shared that space with, with all of the passengers and with their food, all everything they were bringing with them, some animals, so some goats, uh, possibly pigs, we're not clear about that, certainly two dogs. Um, just imagine being below decks for 66 days under those conditions. Um, the ship leaked, so water would have come through. They would have had their chamber pots right there. And when the water swept through, those would have been emptied. It must have been absolutely horrific. Um, they did encounter bad weather. The, it started out okay, so they probably got up on deck in the beginning. But as the um, journey progressed, they hit storms. The North Atlantic, the, the, the Atlantic in general is horrible um, in the late autumn and winter and they hit some ferocious weather. There were times when they had to take their sails down and just glide. Um, so there was uh, quite a bit of seasickness. So again, that would have contributed, contributed to a very unpleasant environment. Um, it must have been absolutely awful. Um, in some ways, it's actually incredible that they made it. Um, another element that would have made it very difficult, would have made this journey seem very long, is although we tend to think of this group as being all religious separatists, actually it was quite a disparate group. There were, there were different interests being represented. Uh, so um, on board there were economic migrants and also the religious separatists. And the reason for this was they needed to fill the boat and make money, the people who were sponsoring the boat. So there were probably about 54 separatists on board. And then the remaining of the adult passengers, um, about 31 would have been non-separatists. That doesn't mean they weren't religious, but they were going for other reasons. They, they weren't as dedicated to creating a godly society. And this became relevant when they arrived in the new world. There was also the crew to consider. They had very different interests. So there definitely were difficulties on board. Um, the Mayflower Pilgrims were a pretty serious group. They believed that Sunday was time to be religious and they would sing. And some of the records of their journey um, talk about this constant singing on Sunday. And it probably was difficult uh, for, for some of the passengers to deal with that. Um, but one of the reasons why the Mayflower Pilgrims might have such an enormous legacy in the USA is because of, a, of, of these differences and how they resolved them. So when they landed, uh, when they arrived uh, at um, America, what, what would be America, they signed a document and th they were 500 miles north of where they should be. Um, and this is really significant because they didn't have a legal right to settle where they'd landed near Plymouth. Um, they only had a patent from the English government to settle in Virginia, where there already was a colony, the Jamestown colony, which had been established years before. So this gave them no legal status and the economic migrants or the non-religious people on board began to talk about they might go their separate ways. 
And the religious leaders on board realized that they needed everybody. They needed all hands on deck, everybody to be unified. And so they quickly drafted a document. Now, this document is legendary in American history. It's said to have influenced the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Um, you can debate about that, but the important thing to know is that it is the first written framework of government in what was to be the United States. So it is a significant document. Um, scholars look to this document all the time. Um, so that part's true. What is untrue is probably this representation that you see on your screen now. Everything looks dry and cozy and everybody's happily signing. Um, remember that the passengers were living below decks and it was probably wet. And the signing probably didn't go quite like this. It was probably more that the document was quickly drafted, um, it likely to be William Brewster as he was quite educated, and then perhaps passed around for people to sign. Um, how willing everyone was to sign is unclear, but all 41 male passengers did sign that Mayflower Compact. So hugely significant because it kept everybody working together um, when they got off the boat. And once they had signed that document, they did get off the boat. Um, this is a um, linen postcard that shows how the Mayflower might have looked at the time of arrival. It was cold. You can see snow in the background. They had this little ship here with which they went to explore the land. Um, and they originally landed off of what is today called Provincetown on Cape Cod. Um, they decided that was too rough. It was it was um, too difficult to land there. So they moved on to Plymouth. Um, they also had an encounter with Native Americans there that didn't go so well. That's a that's another story. It's complicated, but they did relocate to Plymouth um, onto land that they believed was vacant. It wasn't. There were members of the Wampanoag tribe living there. And remember I said that most of the population had been wiped out, but there were survivors and they were members of the Wampanoag Nation. So why did they remain quiet? Well, um, one can speculate, but probably they were watching to see these English settlers and they decided that they could indeed use the help of the English settlers, much as the English settlers could use their help. So they worked together and it was actually a very peaceful union that lasted for about 50 years. The reason that the Wampanoags needed the English settlers was because this was a very tribal area and they were constantly at war with the Narragansett. So the survivors of the plague in the Wampanoag nation want they had firepower. And indeed the English settlers remained loyal to the Wampanoag. Uh, the Wampanoag Nation at that time was led by a man called Massasoit. The problems didn't really arise until Massasoit had died and his son, Medicom, um, rebelled against the abundance of English settlers who followed. So the irony of the tale is that Massasoit, by enabling the uh, success of Plymouth Colony, Sadly, he may have underwritten the demise of the Native American population because that encouraged England to send more settlers and they came in huge numbers. They had more firepower, a different way of living, and they basically overpowered the Native American population. So it's a, it's a story with a very sad ending. But for our intents and purposes, um, the union was peaceful um, during the time of this initial group's settlement. So I thought I would take us back to um, Rotherhithe and how it looks today. Uh, certainly not recognizable to the Mayflower Pilgrims. It's barely recognizable to me in the 30 years since I've been here. It's changed so much. You can see Tower Bridge at the center there. Um, it, it's important to note again that the 400th anniversary is making efforts to tell the Wampanoag side of the story. And there is a place in Plymouth, Massachusetts that's always been called Plymouth Plantation. And it's now um, integrating much more of the Native American story. So there are members of Wampanoag Nation that actually work at Plymouth Plantation and tell their story. So that's a really, really positive note to end on. I think it's a wider focus of this important point in history. And I thought I'd close with a quote from my ancestor, William Bradford, uh, who wrote, 
As one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shone on to many. So thank you so much for listening today. Emily, thank you so much. That was fascinating. It's, um, it's a story that everyone knows. I think they've all heard about the Pilgrim Fathers and the Mayflower, but you don't know actual the story of how it all happened and the way you explained what a difficult journey it must have been. It must have been so uh, weird for people. They were crapped in this little boat and they had no idea what they were going to find at the other end of the journey. Yeah. Um, and you say there's 30 million, did you say, descendants from the Mayflower? Yeah, it's, it's, that's what I've heard, 35 million worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, but what's incredible is um, just the 37 um, people that, that who produced um, offspring. Mm -hmm. So many died. It must have just been terrible. And was it was something you were aware of from when you were um, born, really? Was it something that was passed down through families that you were descend descended from these, these people? Oh, yeah, it was a very big deal in my family. Absolutely. And I was fed a very pilgrim centric story. Um, you know, as many, I think many children in the New England area um, grow up with this side of the story. It's it's really only been, um, I don't know, the past 20 years or so um, that that people are willing to acknowledge the side of the Native Americans. And, and it's such a fascinating story. And it, it should just encompass both sides. Mm -hmm. it's, Absolutely. And there is a website, isn't there? I think it's the Mayflower, Mayflower 400 website yes. where you can find all kinds of resources about the yes. Mayflower and yeah, the celebrations. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and well, you've also got your website. I know that you do tours of Rotherhide, so you can show people these places, and you do virtual tours as well. Yes. So, um, just give us the website again to tell us the best place, best way to yes. get in touch. Okay. With you. So you can just email me directly if you want, um, Emily Lawrence Baker at gmail.com, or you can book one of the virtual tours or, or walking tours when we get back to business at the London tour group.com. Great. Um, so lots of comments. People are finding it really interesting, says Donnelly. Thank you, Donna. Um, fantastically told. Big thumbs up there. Um, thanks to Sarah. She says um, learned a lot from this and Victoria as well. So thank you everyone from for watching today. Um, we do have the website as well, the Guide London website. And if you want to know more about Emily or any of our guides, then you simply type in guidelondon.org.uk, and that brings you up to our website. There you can search for all the guides. So if you put in Emily, it will give you all the guides who are. Her named Emily, and there are two of you. <laughs> and you trained together, I think, didn't you? Yes, we did, and we're actually we both are part of um, our little group, um, the London Tour Group. So okay, but it's not compulsory to be called Emily to join. It to is not compulsory to, to be called Emily. No. <laughs> so if you click on people's profiles, you can um, get a little bit more of information about there, so you can find out all about Emily there, and you can find out when she's available as well if you want to book her. And we hope that when the pandemic is over and you come back to London and you will hire some of our guys to show you around the city. Um, we also, on the website, have some tours. This gives you some of the ideas of the different things that our guys will offer. So tours can be bespoke to you. You just tell us what you want to see, and we can arrange tours around you. But the page here gives you some ideas. We've got William Shakespeare tours, British Museum, uh, Cotswold, Charles Dickens, all kinds of things you can see. Just go to the website, guidelondon.org. UK. And don't forget, a lot of our tours can be done virtually as well at the moment. When we can't actually come here in person, you can book guides who will get put together a presentation for you and walk you through virtually some of the great sites of London. So thank you once again to Emily for telling us that fascinating story thank today. Thank you. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you indeed for watching. We hope to see you again next Tuesday. So come us. Goodbye. <laughs>